So with that, we're going to um, reconvene. And Patrick, um, if you could take us to the next hospital. All right, Porter Medical Center. Their FY21 request for NPR FPP represents 2.7% growth over their uh, fiscal year 20 budget. Uh, is below the 3.5% growth rate ceiling set forth by the board. Their change in charge represents a 0.0% overall change in charge request and a 5.75% commercial change in uh, commercial change in their effective rate. Um, <clears throat> They have not budgeted a risk reserve in the coming year as they are rolling over their um, reserves related to the ACO from prior years on their balance sheet. Um, their justifications include a need to balance and manage expense growth and <laughs> that it is necessary to support um, the nursing home. Uh, this is a hospital who also has had um, some pretty solid budget management over the years and has produced um, some relative margins in recent years. Uh, most notably, uh, they had a 5.2% margin in their fiscal year 2019. This is a hospital that affiliated with the network in fiscal year 2017 and, and the years leading up to that that are not visible on this um, had some financial difficulty but has since rebounded from that. Um, and in fiscal year 20 here, they are projecting a 2.8 million dollar, <clears throat> excuse me, bottom line operating gain and their budget um, includes a 4.5% operating margin, which is equal to $4.37 million. Uh, so moving on to the 2.7% the request as previously stated is within the 3.5% guidelines. Um, we would accept their overall change in charge of 0.0, .0 but reduce their commercial effective rate to three, which would have um, an impact on MPR reduction uh, to 1.8% in change in charge. Um, we would look for um, the hospital to um, have commensurate reductions to expenses, as we've stated for other hospitals where we have recommended a reduced NPR. Um, and I believe <clears throat> we ran some calculations late yesterday that with uh, the staff's recommendation, this would bring their operating margin down from 4.5 to 3.8, just to give you some context around what that decision does for that margin, uh, because we do believe that <clears throat> the margin overall was not uh, fully justified. So with that, we turn it over to um, the board for discussion on Porter Medical Center. Sure, thank you, Patrick. And I'll jump in first. Um, your closing statement really focused on my concerns here in that um, I worry about equity in the process when a number of hospitals come in with uh, a budget that's requesting an operating margin in these uncertain times that's just above zero. And here we have one that came in at 4.5. It was the highest one that I, I think, I'd have to go back through and look at them all again, but it was the highest um, budgeted operating margin. And even reducing um, to the 3.8, I think it still keeps it at the top of the uh, list uh, on that operating margin. So. That's my biggest concern about this hospital in that um, I just uh, worry about equity in the system. So with that, I'll turn it over to other board members. Yeah, one of the things I'll point out is I, I do think that their top line number that they came in with um, may be aggressive. It is under the three and a half um, percent, so I'm not saying that we necessarily should adjust that, but they were trending, I believe, 7% down through uh, February. And, um, you know, their request um, year over year, 2.7 seems low relative to that. Um, and even with their change in charge request, which I believe in total was 1.2 million, uh, my concern would just be that they may not hit their top line. So I would just put that out as a caveat. I'm not going to reduce their top line because it's within the three and a half percent, but it is a hospital that where they were trending was was below. Um, the 5.75 commercial is, you know, on the higher side. Um, definitely would look at talking about, you know, bifurcating the charge into potentially two pieces and whether or not it's as high as 5.75 or, you know, a reduction to, 
the three percent that the staff put, and you know whether it's three percent base and a one percent COVID or something like that. I mean, um, I, I do think that the margins they're reporting are are high. Um, we know that they've benefited from being with um, the with UVM, and that's that that that's good and they've reflected in the past, you know, lower rate requests because of that. Um, but this year, the 5.75 is, you know, much higher than they, what they've requested over the past five years. Um, and obviously, there was discussion about, you know, Helen Porter and the need to to support that. Um, I don't dispute that Helen Porter needs to be supported. It's just is that at the at the backs of the commercial rate payers um, in order to provide a higher margin that's then able to support um, support the, that um, Helen Porter as well. So, yeah, my uh, my observation is that um, Porter's presentation was a very good pre presentation, and they have uh, been and are probably out of a recovery mode at this point in time. Um, the only wrinkle for me was um, the, uh, the 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 nursing home and and the kind of uh, as Kevin was talking about the equity between uh, say Porter's situation with their nursing home and Central Vermont's situation with their nursing home. Um, I do note that the rich operating margin um, is a uh, um, is offset to some extent uh, because it, it includes um, amounts that, that do then flow uh, to the nursing home. And I, I think in uh, reading the staff material that they looked at the auditing financial statements of the nursing home and the hospital or the hospital for the last three years, and there's been an increasing amount of uh, transfer uh, to the nursing home, I think the most recent one was over three million dollars, which um, which means that the net operating margin for the hospital itself um, will will be diminished quite a you know quite a bit um, in 2021. But I do think that that is an equity issue that has to be sorted out. Maybe not in this budget cycle, but but there there clearly is an equity there that, that you know that that needs to. Um, be, be addressed, but I, I can I can support the staff recommendation on this on Porter. So I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, a couple of things. This one's an interesting hospital to be thinking about. They have rebounded, but I would say that their day's cash on hand are still below the state average. So the rebound has taken some time, but we're still not even at the state average. Um, I think the the chart that you have up now is really an important one. If we look at the um, approved commercial over time or, or the approved overall, but I think the more relevant one is the approved commercial. It's 2.17% over the five years. So this actually has changed my mind a little bit on this hospital, um, given that the adjustment has been made to this chart in the sense that this is you know, well below the median change in charge and they are a low base hospital as well. So their commercial to Medicare ratio is low. Um, I think it's the third lowest of all the 14 hospitals. So their base is low and their growth rate has been low. Um, so you know, I do think that their margin is high. It is, you're right, Kevin, it's the highest of any hospital. Um, and it's, I think the second highest would be UVM with 2.5. So it's a big delta between where Porter is coming in at and where the next closest hospital's margins coming in. At. And that, you know, did stand out to me as well. Um, I think the issue with the nursing home is something we have to grapple with. And I think that there are every hospital has services within its mix that are cross subsidized. Um, so hospitals that have mental health, you know, inpatient beds are, are those I'm, I'm sure are probably being cross subsidized by something like orthopedics. Um, so we have to think differently. I think going forward about how we want to treat the nursing homes. Um, it's a separate tax ID number, if I understand correctly. So it is treated as a separate entity, but it is it is being funded largely by the by Porter Hospital. So. Um, I understand the equity concerns, but I also would recognize that there's a lot of cross subsidization happening at many hospitals, depending upon their service mix. Um, and it is a resource in our community uh, here in Middlebury that I know people rely on. So I would worry that uh, if we cut them off this year because 
you know, there may be some compromise of um, services offered there. But it's something we need to think about, look at carefully, and think about how we want to uh, evaluate. But I think we need to do that in the next budget cycle. I'm not sure this is the budget cycle to do that. So I guess where I'm landing is I think that, uh, you know, their, their base is low. Their growth rates have been low and below the median. Um, they're, they have some room with their margin, although it's not as large as, as simply shown here because of Helen Porter, which we do need to address. I do think that the, the NPR might be high. And so I would worry about them even making that margin if their expenses are being uh, calculated based on an NPR that they may or may not hit, to Maureen's point. So I also worry there. So where I'm landing is I think, you know, we have been giving uh, commercial rates of, of increases of 4%, you know, to many of these hospitals. I'm comfortable. I would I would go above the staff's recommendation of a 3% commercial rate. I might do 3 plus plus a COVID or straight up, frankly, 4% for this hospital for all the reasons that I outlined. Yeah, I can support a 3 and a 1 as well. But I just, just could you go back, um, Patrick, to the, the slide that was showing the commercial changes? Um, I, I don't, um, maybe someone needs to explain to me on 16, how we can have an approved overall and a submitted overall of 5.3% um, rate, correct? And then approved commercial of zero. That just seems to be inconsistent. I think I can probably explain that. I think when Porter, so I, I don't think that Porter is reimbursed as a percentage of charge by the commercial payers. They're reimbursed on a negotiated schedule. And so the change in charge may not actually impact the approved com the commercial at all. Okay. If I'm right about that. And, and remember too, this, since they've joined the network, they've begun to ask for that effective rate that the medical center asked for. So <clears throat> this is only taking into consideration if they broke that out and requested that specifically. That's it. Before they um, came under the affiliation with the network, they were requesting um, overall changes in charges. And as you can see, that has not been the case. They've instead uh, changed their, their tactic to request a commercial effective rate. So that's just capturing that. It not, they don't bleed over into the other one. That's yeah, no, that's people. why I thought maybe 16, and I was trying to go back and pull up the documents from 16 to see what they got because I, I don't recall I wasn't here then, but I'm not. I'm so would be surprised if it was zero if they had a five for three, five point three percent overall, which is then factoring into that blended year five year average. But um, I'm okay with what Jess had suggested, which was uh, the the three percent and one percent or four percent. Um, but I, I think separating out a COVID piece um, gives us more flexibility. And I'll just jump back in that. Um... I think even at the staff recommended level, they're still the highest um, approved um, budget with the highest um, operating margin. And so anything over the staff recommend, um, I think I will oppose, but we are a five member board. So that's what makes us beautiful. <laughs> Can I just ask a quick question on that note? The the Patrick and Lori, if you could answer this, or if some other board member can answer this, the the four point five percent margin. What is it once you include Helen Porter? That was in the narrative, and I don't have that in front of me. I just want to make sure that I understand what that actually is. The four. When you mean included, do you mean the distributions they've been making? Well, there was. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but there was an adjustment or there was a there was a point that they made once they included the distributions, right, what what their margin would be. That I don't recall. Uh, OK. Again, this is where not being able to understand um, what's happening with the finances of the nursing home um, in 2021. Um, those distribute, I mean, it depends on what they need to cover the shortfall um, in operations over there. So 
So I see, it looks like Jen Bertrand just raised her hand, so she may be able to weigh in on that. Um, if, if you don't mind, I, I, I can speak to that. It brings our margin down to two and a half percent. The budgeted subsidy to Helen Porter for um, FY21 is approximately $2 million. Um, and I can, uh, I can elaborate on that during public comment too for the board. Okay, other board conversation? This one's a little bit tough because I, I can see both sides of the issue and um, I am sympathetic given um, a lot of the nursing home issues we have in the state for the need to maintain those services in the community. I would however say that Medicaid does have processes where nursing homes can request modifications in their rate because of financial difficulties. I don't know how that plays out in this situation so I'm hesitant to rely on that that knowledge too much. Um, and the other thing that is a little bit problematic is we don't know the CRF funds that would fall or not fall to the bottom line. And we're quite frankly, I don't think going to know that um, because I don't know that we want to wait um, on this budget until effectively next week. So, uh, so I'm struggling a little bit, I guess, um, with whether I would land with Kevin or whether I would land at the 3% plus 1% COVID. I'm definitely in that range. I'm just uh, gonna continue thinking while other folks make comments and we hear from the public. Yeah, I'll just put a little context too. So what was recorded in their charts is that um, the value of 1% charge on commercial is $278,000. So if we were to go to 4%, um, that would be a $486,000 reduction. Um, and assuming for sake of argument that just fell to the bottom line that they didn't have cost savings, which I always think are um, available to look for more cost savings and efficiencies, but um, that would be half a percent on their operating margin which would bring them down to their reported margin of four. And then um, where Jenna just said it would be, you know, $2 million to Porter, um, that would bring them down to, I think, a 2% um, operating margin and then a higher total margin. Just, just to put into context what, a, what it would be for a 4%. And, you know, I, I do think because of the Uncertainty. I understand what people are saying with potentially a 3%, but I think with the uncertainty of COVID, if we put in a COVID allowance, we then can review that next year. Again, I think we've said mid-year and at year end. And at that time, there'll be a lot more clarity on what happened you know, for 2020, what type of funding they received, where they are on their balance sheet, and you know, then we could look to make adjustments if necessary, or continue with that. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to to go on the higher end because I think it gives us that flexibility on the COVID piece. And with just so much uncertainty with this whole process, um, that you know, one percent is two hundred and seventy-seven thousand um, dollars. And you know, they certainly, even though maybe they hadn't documented completely, there are COVID-related increases, um, whether that was in PPE, PPE slower, um, uh, you know, uh, lose, losing volume, et cetera, that's impacting that. So that's where I land, but. That's definitely helpful, Maureen. So thank you for sharing those thoughts. Um, I think for me, um, now, having thought about this for another minute or two, <laughs> this is the hardest part for me during the deliberation is sometimes I need a little more time to think, but I don't want to slow the process down. I think I am have gotten myself comfortable to the to three percent and a one percent covid for the reasons um, that Maureen and Jess have explained. And also, I would note, um, you know, Jen has done a fantastic job. Um, as CFO, she's been a leader in um, figuring out the critical access hospital issues. So I trust that she 
uh, if she sees something going differently than expected that she will um, communicate that because that has been the pattern in the past. So I think um, I think I would be comfortable there. And um, I, if people are ready, I can make a motion. Anytime you're ready, Robert. Okay. So I would move to approve Porter Medical Center's budget with uh, a three percent standard increase uh, to the effective commercial rate and a 1% COVID-19 uh, increase to the effective commercial rate with commensurate uh, modifications to the NPR FPP subject to the standard budget conditions on slide 27. Is there a second? I'll second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Porter Medical Senators budget with a uh, standard commercial change in charge of 3% and a COVID um, piece of 1% for a total of a 4% increase in the effective commercial rate um, and commensurate with the um, appropriate M NPR FPP um, that staff will calculate and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. Did I accurately portray that, Robin? Yes. yes. Thank you. Further board discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment. And I heard uh, Jen say that she wanted to offer some additional comments and public comment. So Jen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. I appreciate that. I, I just do want to clarify a few things for the board and speak specifically to um, a couple of expense items as well as Helen Porter. Um, and I know that there was maybe some discussion about our COLA or cost of living adjustment for our staff. And I did just want to make a couple clarifications there that the total wage increase for Porter was actually uh, 1.4 million and not 2.1 million. That 2.1, <clears throat> excuse me, includes all of our inflationary expense increases, that's benefits, supplies, and pharmaceuticals in that dollar amount. Our cost of living for the staff actually is $485,000, and we have some uh, required market adjustments for our provider group per contract that's about half a million dollars. But one of the biggest things that's in that dollar amount I wanted to touch on is our wage compression issues, and we have about 420,000 in our budget for that. So we're, we are significantly behind market in our wages, I'll be honest. In 2018, our compensation consultants had reported uh, that we are behind the market in Vermont by 5%. And we've not been able to really adequately address that deficit. Uh, so our budget does attempt to incrementally do this, and we're going to do this over a multi-year um, time frame. But um, I just want to touch on, you know, cutting those expenses is really um, a need for this organization, that two and a half percent cost of living adjustment for our employees, um, you know, to, to talk about that in relationship with a margin target would really continue to put us further behind market. And that is would perpetuate further, um, I'll be honest, a very strange recruitment and retention issue that we have here at Porter. So I just did want to touch on that for a moment. And then. Uh, secondly, I did want to mention as a critical access hospitals for all of us, we build our budgets based on expenses and revenue working in tandem with one another due to our cost based reimbursement. So when you're cutting expenses to balance, you know, any kind of commercial rate reductions or just expenses in general, that will have additional adverse impacts on revenue, especially on that Medicare reimbursement side. So I did just want to, to mention that. And um, lastly, uh, well, actually, before I talk about Helen Porter for a moment, I just wanted to touch on the um, CFR piece of this for just a, a moment to, to shed some clarity. Um, what Porter is requesting is for the uh, fixed perspective payment reconciliation. Um, and those dollars for 778,000 that we've, we are currently requesting 
Um, as you heard yesterday, it is still pending right now, and I wanted to mention that. But um, just candidly, that's already reflected in our current 2020 projection because we will essentially just be writing that check over to one care to pay CMS. So I just did want to make that clarification there too. Um, and lastly, the conversation regarding Helen Porter, and I certainly appreciate and understand that um, this is not regulated, this part of our business, and there are certainly reasons why we are separate EINs, and this is really from a cost reporting perspective. Both, both entities do have to file discrete cost reporting, especially when you have a parent organization. But the reality is that the hospital does have to subsidize them in order to keep their doors open. And I really wanted to kind of expound upon what the hospital, what would happen at the hospital if we didn't leverage that current transition to care that is really candidly made more efficient by having them being part of our organization. And simply the cost of care to the system would increase um, with patient transfers. Those would actually be delayed under a traditional transfer model. And this is a little shocking sometimes when you put these numbers to it. It's a 350% difference in the daily rate between the hospital and the nursing home. And if you look at that in dollars, it's $1,400 per patient per day, which is why we've leveraged Helen Porter so much as part of our population health initiative and being part of our success in population health. And we talked about that last year during our presentation too, about how we, um, leveraged Helen Porter and that transition to care to save um, overall dollars to the system. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, kind of point out too that this would actually have an unfavorable impact on the cost ship because if we kept those patients in the hospital, there's certainly an impact to that on the cost ship side of the equation. Um, so I did want to mention that. And, and, you know, the last thing I think is the the rate request that we have from a percent standpoint i mentioned this um, during our hearing is certainly um, looks higher but in fact the dollar amount is relatively low and that does strictly cover the majority not all of, of the hospitals and fa inflationary factors um, so i did just want to mention that and kind of give some real context to how Porter. Um, and, you know, maybe there's some discussion that we can all have about how we can roll them in and present them in the future, um, because it does bring our margin down significantly. And I will say they are a five star nursing home and it does take a lot to maintain that quality level from an expense standpoint. And thank you. I really appreciate you all letting me speak today. Thank you, Jen. Um, I see that. Uh, Thomas Thompson has his hand up as well. Uh, Chair Mullen, thank you. Um, if you recall, I presently serve as the interim president and chief operating officer for Porter Medical Center. I raised my hand probably a little prematurely because I know Jen covers every single topic, as you well know, and gotten acquainted with over the years. Um, and as has been cited, we have a history here of submitting very responsible budgets. Um, and the the one, only one uh, piece of gens that I want to build on is the one that's related to the workplace uh, and the workforce planning uh, requirements of our budget, which um, I think uh, just start to capture the issue that we need relative to the marketplace and wage competitiveness. And so as such, you know, with that 5.75 commercial rate uh, request, that really is helping us support a budget that's just starting to get at our issues and um, why we submitted the level that we did. And again, appreciate uh, the hard work you guys do. Um, the only other thing I want to, I just want to add to her comment on Helen Porter just quickly. You know, we've just completed and our board just approved our strategy map for a three year uh, window to take us into the future here at Porter Medical Center. And that, 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 that plan has a very, very strong emphasis on value. Um, and as you know, we have uh, our, I think the highest as far as percentage uh, patients served on uh, uh, the value-based model in the state. It's something the organization has taken some pride in and will only continue to improve in. And uh, uh, Jen can certainly get at, as she just did, the dollar impact of our long-term care and rehab service at Helen Porter upon value delivery here. 
Um, but as far as obviously the patient and resident experience, it's also instrumental in serving the community. And so with that, I thank you for your service and uh, this opportunity to address the group this morning. Thank you, Thomas. Other public comment. Hearing none, the motion before the board is to approve Porter Medical Center's budget with a overall 4% increase in the um, effective commercial rate with 3% um, allocated to the standard change in charge and 1% to a COVID related change in charge with staff preparing the um, appropriate NPR FPP uh, numbers for the change from FY20 to 21 budget with um, this being subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 27. Is there further board discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Uh, let the record indicate that it was a four to one vote. Patrick. I think the record needs to reflect that votes of each individual board member under the open meetings law. So that would be all four board members except for the chair voting in favor and the chair voting no. Correct. Thanks. Okay, the next hospital up is Central Vermont Medical Center. Their uh, MPR request for fiscal year 21 represents 8.7% growth over their fiscal year 20 budget request, which is in excess of the 3.5% growth rate ceiling. Their change in charges, they're requesting a 6% overall change in charge and 8.5% commercial effective rate change in charge. <clears throat> uh, they have justified this request by noting that their expenses have exceeded revenue since 2016, and the main drivers of this have been salary and pharmaceutical costs, um, <clears throat> a higher collection trend, and uh, increase in volume of 1.5% is driving this as well. Um, in fiscal year 20, um, their margin was eroding due to a shift in payer mix, growth in pharmaceutical and labor inflation, and unpredictable volumes. Uh, as of February 2020, they were operating at almost 3% above budget. <clears throat> and, um, Laurie, if you could navigate to the there, thank you very much. Um, so we see here that <clears throat> uh, from tw the last year of actuals in 2019 um, to the coming 2021 budget, they're looking to grow about $20 million in NPR over the course of those years with uh, FY20 being kind of the anomaly given what we know. Um, this is a hospital also who has seen um, several years here of uh, negative operating margins, including they are projecting to lose $4.5 million as of this budget submission. And this request produces a uh, nominal margin of 0.5% for a value of $1.2 million. Um, again, we broke this out. Um, we discussed it with uh, Porter as member Holmes noted, so we figured we should probably spend a little more time here on that breakout as we kind of addressed it pretty quickly yesterday. So um, approved an overall change in charges, 2.4 and 2.5% approved and submitted respectively. And they have also shifted towards the commercial effective rate request. However, they do continue to ask for approved overall change in charges in uh, coordination with those. And last year, you can see your approval was at 5.9%, which is what they requested and 3% overall change in charges, which is what they requested. So. So here we focused on the change in charge, and uh, we did this as we expressed in the review of this hospital earlier. Uh, we believe that the um, provider tax was budgeted at a, at a rate that's too high. And Laura, if you can navigate to slide 134 so we can spend some time on that. We did receive a response yesterday from the network, which does help clarify why the figure was budgeted where it was budgeted for essential Vermont. <clears throat> and this also applies to the UVM Medical Center. And uh, what they've said is that um, they've received advice from their auditors that they haven't been that they haven't been appropriately accounting for it with the accrual method of accounting, which tells them that uh, they need to realize the tax at the same time they realize the revenue upon which the tax is based. So if they earn $100 million in the month of October 21, then their tax will be essentially 6% of that or $6 million for that month, which is fine and appropriate because they need to do their accounting in accordance with guidance from their auditors and GAAP, et cetera. However, we still disagree with the increase here because 
DIVA is going to assess their tax differently than the way they are going to account for it from our perspective. DIVA is going to look back at the month of October 2019 through March 2020. They're going to take those revenues, multiply it by two, divide it by 12, and they're going to assess a nine-month tax based on what the hospital brought in during that time. And then in the spring, April through June, when they receive the audited financials for fiscal year 2020, they're going to true that up, and they're going to base their tax for the rest of the year either up or down on the revenues that were actually generated from the medical center, in this one specifically Central Vermont. So they're accounting for it in a way that is appropriate, and they factored that into their budget, but the actual tax they're going to realize is still going to be on 2020. So that we believe there's still going to be a discrepancy there between budget and what they actually pay. And we are willing to back away from any hard number suggestion for the board. But when we're looking at the trend analysis here, it also does not connect the dots for us. And we respect the accounting methodology and the explanation that they've provided, but we still don't feel that that is actually going to come to realization. So we think there's room for um, a cut here in that rate, allow them to keep that expense structure to fall to their bottom line so that they can maintain a bottom line relative to what they need. Because with all due respect, it's pretty slim at 0.5%. So with that, we turn it over to the board for discussion on Central Vermont Medical Center. Thank you, Patrick. Board members? Uh, Patrick, I just want a little more clarification on the provider tax as far as um, what number you're saying it should be. Um, I you know, went back and was reading some of the transcripts and some of the other information about what the hospital had said at the time and then looked at what they sent us where it does seem, as you said, they're, they're changing their accounting methodology, that they've been doing it wrong. Um, I've been through many audits, and it's surprising that an accounting firm as well as the um, the staff would be doing it wrong every year, and that it wouldn't be noticed or talked about. Usually, you show your work papers, and that's a fairly straightforward calculation. You either did it on the prior year or you did it on the current year, and I, I would imagine they would have work papers to show that. Um, and if now they're changing that methodology um, to reflect a, a change in 21 budget, um, which I believe I know for for the for UVM would have been about a two percent uh, relative would equate to about a two percent in the tax rate, and I'd like to get that for CVMC as well because either they're going to get the benefit then in 20, which they haven't fully reflected or they're going to get it in 21, um, although now they're going to, it seems like they're changing how they do this. And someone had to have calculations on how this was done. And it was either clearly done off the, because they said they it was delayed three to six months from the lag on the provider tax because of the information that they would then receive from, from DIVA. So it seemed like they were always chewing it up to what they owed in that year. And so, therefore, they were accruing for when the taxes were owed and paid, which was the year after. So I, I do have an issue with uh, a change in methodology at this point. doesn't seem like that's the time to, to make that change. And if they've been doing it wrong all along, that is surprising that their work papers wouldn't have been reviewed by their auditors because it is stated in the audit, the provider tax, you know, there is a comment in the audit about provider tax as well. So, um, you know, I guess my, maybe Mark wants to respond to that. He's got his hand up. <laughs> yeah, if possible, I'd like to keep uh, discussion to the board until we open it up to public comment. Actually, Kevin, I was just going to speak to the specific accounting component that Maureen had, not public comment, but I'll follow um, whatever practice you would like to take. Yeah, I think, Mark, uh, um, if you could hold off, because I'm, I am confused on this, and um, just if um, to prepare you for when you speak under public comment, uh, we did receive a letter um, from the network today acknowledging a $430,000 um, 
reduction in um, the calculation for that. So if you could address all of that during the public comment period, it would be good. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Board member comments? I think uh, relative to the provider tax, um, there is, you know, there are some hospitals that don't even do it in conjun conjunction with DIVA. Uh, Northwestern, when we, uh, uh, you know, talked to their CFO, um, um, you know, had said that she was totally unaware of DIVA ever, you know, being involved in in uh, giving a prospective amount for um, a future fiscal year. And I worry a lot about taking one accounting method and inserting it surgically into this process um, where that same accounting methods might apply to other elements of the hospital budget process. So we're on a budgetary basis. Um, there's been a, a traditional approach across most hospitals as to how to calculate that tax. And it's 6% of the prior year's um, <clears throat> uh, NPR. And, uh, you know, if you kind of look retrospectively, that's what the numbers come out with when you kind of look at what hospitals have been paying on their 2019 tax. So I, I worry that we're kind of, we get into a situation here, mixing and matching methodologies um, for one particular item, but not kind of scrubbing the whole process to make sure that everything is perfectly aligned. So just to jump in on that, Tom, um, um, my point of view is a little bit different. I think that all hospitals should be doing it on an accrual basis and it, the tax should be uh, um, applicable to the period in which it was um, literally incurred because it's based on the revenues for a given year. And I would prefer if all hospitals did accrue it so that's a simple 6% of the, um, the the revenue that it's based on that's, that's in the budget. Um, but with that being said, this is very confusing because it still seems even with that to um, be beyond um, what that is. So we'll we'll get uh, further explanation in the public comment period, but it, it is uh, troubling. Other board members? If not, then I'm going to go to the public comment because I think a lot of board members really want to hear what you have to say, Mark, as we try to grapple with this issue. So uh, the first person I'll call on is Mark Stanislaus. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, I will speak specifically to the provider tax and um, you know reserve the right to come back um, based upon further conversation. But as it relates to the provider tax, um, the reason why this is so glaring in the FY21 budget is, is because the revenues have been more stable previously and the impact that COVID has had on the NPR in FY20 has raised this to a materiality level that would fall within an auditor's will review threshold. Okay, because when auditors do the annual review, it falls within thresholds and dollar amounts. And so, so like we had said before, um, previously, we haven't been using the accrual methodology, but because the revenue flow has been so stable and consistent, the materiality level of the difference hasn't raised to the threshold. Given the impact on COVID or the impact of COVID on the hospitals and how it has impacted NPR, which is the driver behind the provider tax, like so many other things this year, we had to sharpen our pencils on a lot of calculations, like the debt service calculation. We had to sharpen our pencil on that like we had never had before. So, you know, while we do acknowledge that this has been a change in accounting practice, it has not been a material impact that would be flagged under audit. The decrease 
in NPR for FY21 based upon the accrual accounting methodology. And like you had said, Kevin, with a matching principle, you know, um, uh, the downstream of, of the provider tax decrease would be recognized in FY20. Okay, and 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 so hopefully that speaks to some of the components that Maureen had had. The reason why CVMC, if you just look at the FY21 budget numbers, appears to be slightly over 6%. If you just did that calculation, I think it was Tom or Kevin that had mentioned it, is because that includes the provider tax well for Woodridge, which is about $750,000. So if you were to remove both components of the revenue um, and the tax related well to Woodridge, you would see that it falls within that 6% corridor that we had discussed earlier. So I will stop there. Um, this section of the public comment that I was only using to respond to the provider tax question, but I would like to end by saying, you know, a, booking the provider tax in the year that it was assessed versus the period that it's billed, because that's what the difference is, um, is there's about, and I'm using very, very broad, you know, references, but there's about a 12 month lag in which DIVA bills on. That's the cash basis accounted methodology on when you pay the bill, it is booked in your statements. On the accrual methodology, you know, um, to stay consistent with our overall accounting practice is uh, um, under the accrual methodology, you know, um, we believe in FY21, the provider tax is stated correctly based upon those accrual accounting methodologies. And, and we also um, are reporting FY20, FY21 in the same manner. So, you know, that's going to be subject to audit by our accountants. So um, that's where, you, you know, that's where our perspectives stand on the provider tax discussion. So Mark uh, I appreciate uh, the explanation, and maybe I'm just thick, but I'm trying to reconcile it to the letter that came in this morning from uh, Dr. Brumstead. Okay, and so. in, in that letter, um, there is the statement um, that, uh, as requested, we met with Green Mountain Care Board staff and came to the conclusion that our fiscal year 21 provider tax should be reduced by approximately 430000 Okay. So help me understand that. No, well, I, I mean, in all of these conversations, I think like what we said before under public comment, well, that we would speak with staff and we would recheck our FY21 calculation. And when we recheck the FY21 calculation based upon that accrual accounting methodology and the actual revenues in the FY21 budget, the number would be 430,000 less, Kevin. So this um, probably is one that maybe the staff may need some time over lunch to uh, do some crunching on because um, it's it's clear that you're in agreement that it was overstated by 430,000. Um, so uh, board members, do you have further questions of Mark on this on this issue? Hi, welcome. Uh I became chair of Central Mount Medical Center in January, so I figured it would be good to help give the board some perspective or my perspective from a board level in regards to where we are at with Central Mount Medical Center and our affiliation with the network. You know, I'll start off by saying, you know, the numbers, Mark, Mark can answer any of those in specifics, but I really wanted to give the board some, some understanding of the impact that moving away from, uh, you know, our budgeted presentation would have on the local community. You know, we're being asked, in essence, uh, you know, we're at a critical phase, I believe, here in the turnaround phase for Central Mountain Medical Center. Um, you know, we're looking to really just break even at this stage. Um, I think getting back to the Porter discussion in regards to a nursing home, we absorbed that under our own TIN. And we've turned that around in the first phase of this turnaround story. Um, 
uh, the last numbers I saw were their break even. So, you know, to go from losing $3 million a year on a nursing home platform to really being break even now, I think that really impacts our overall number. The second aspect of it is our payer mix, you know, moving away. You know, we really have a significantly different payer mix from from Porter, and I think that really affects our budgeting, uh, you know, process. Um, I really think affiliating with the network as we have over the past number of years and has really prevented Central Vermont Medical Center from being a really disaster story over the past couple of years. We could have been facing huge margin losses, uh, you know, significantly more than we're, we're showing here. Um, I think the turnaround of the past couple of years really is a testament of the work that has been done. And I'd hate to see that momentum, you know, end. If we're, if we're asked from a board perspective to come up with $2 million, um, it's going to seriously impact access to care. It's going to seriously impact our ability to participate in the psychiatric, psychiatric in, inpatient facility planning. It's going to really impact our ability, um, you know, in regards to budgeting for that margin level. So, so I would really ask the board to seriously consider that where we're at in this process, um, give us another year, really look at what the network has put together here. Um, our rate request, I feel, was reasonable. I feel if the board goes with the staff recommendation, it's going to weaken our position to really participate, and it's going to make healthcare in Central Vermont much worse. So, with that, I thank you, and would, would be happy to answer any questions. Um, Thomas, how long have you have you been on the board? I've been on the board for uh, since two thousand. Uh, 2014, 2015. I really started in as chair of the board this year, though. So I've uh, I've just recently joined the uh, UVM Health Network Board um, this current year. So I am chair of the Network uh, Investment Committee, and I've been chair of the CVMC board for the past uh, you know seven months. It's tough in COVID to have <laughs> physical meetings. We had we had a meeting this morning to discuss this. Um, it's not the same as being together. I think Anna and team have put together. And with with Todd's help, we've had some struggles, you know, getting in a long term CFO. So we've been relying on, you know, Todd's work in in dis dissecting some of these issues. But uh, I think we're really at that phase where you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, we can really show significant improvement. And then we can be really good partners with the state on helping with the psychiatric inpatient issue. So that that's our goal. Uh, but. Uh, I'm excited where we're at. I just would hate to see us, you know, go back, you know, and have to cut cut access. Well, I, I hope that you can somehow shorten the time frame on uh, starting to address the uh, psychiatric inpatient issue. But um, I understand these are trying times, and uh, unfortunately, um, much of what will happen depends on what happens with COVID. So, well, I understand uh, we're committed to working with the network to help solve in partnership with the state, the psychiatric issue, because it is a significant issue for our emergency room. And um, we are committed. We just, from a from a financial perspective, uh, we, we need partners in that, both with the network as well as with the uh, state. And so to take on a $100 million project from a negative margin perspective would be very difficult for our board to really um, you know, go after. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can uh, re, re, reinstitute those discussions on the site center. Um, but without the margin, I just think CVMC really has to look at other areas and, and I'd be very, it'd be very difficult for our board to, to, to push that. Um, However, we are significant. We are committed to, to working with Green Mountain Care Board and the state on that that topic. Thank you, Thomas. Um, other members of the public who wish to comment on Central Vermont Medical Center's budget. Hearing none, board members, um, is this something that you would prefer that um, staff get some time over lunch to? Um, crunch what the numbers might be with at least the 430,000 agreed to amount um, from the network, or do you feel you have enough information to proceed now? Um, I think, you know, when, when I look at the 433, um, I believe if we look at it as, as 1% value of commercial charge is $621,000. And so 433,000 or 430, it's, that would be about a 0.7 reduction to the commercial rate ask just for that component. I, 
um, I'm not sure that the staff is going to do any more, you know, any more than that with it. You know, that's what it translates to. I um, tend to agree with you, Maureen, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think the range. I mean, it's it's yep. four hundred thirty thousand, and we have that number. So I think from you know, um, I don't need anything more from the staff right now on that to continue discussion. You know, relative to to that one component. It would be 0.7, which would, would be a factor in the discussion. But I think we haven't really talked about um, looking at the commercial rate, you know, bifurcating it as we have other hospitals. I think for the most part, for other hospitals, the um, barring um, barring one, you know, four percent was the highest that we've done as the base rate, um, barring Northwestern. Um, and then adding a COVID component on top of that. Um, you know, I think their total rate request would have been what, 8.5. So if we took away the 0.7, you know, we, we would reduce that um, component. And then, you know, is there additional that people would want to, to look at? So that would bring us down to 7.8. You know, I mean, I think my 4% is where I'd want to go for the base commercial rate and then put a COVID rate on top, knowing that, you know, certainly that could carry forward. Um, this hospital has been a hospital that historically um, has exceed, has missed their top line and exceeded their expenses um, in the past several years. Um, I think it was in um, in 19. Their actual was was the the 228 for expenses. Um, well, let's go to the top. Their budget for NPR was 211. They came in at 208. Their expenses were budgeted at 221. They came in at 228. In 18, their NPR was budgeted at 198. They came in at 194. Their expenses were budgeted at 208. They came in at 216. Now, if we just look at their expense growth from 19 at 228 to what was the budget of 234, and now 220 in 21 at 253, um, their expenses have are increasing significantly year over year, and they continue to miss their their budget, missing top line and exceeding um, expenses. I don't know what to do about that, but I just want to lay that out there. And that's really the reason for those large declines in 18 and 19 was that combination of missing the top line and then having significant overages in their expenses. Question for Patrick. Um, before you go, Robin, a question for Patrick that I have, and you may want to work on this while Robin's speaking, but I just want to uh, to make sure that um, the 0 0.7 is accurate. And, and uh, what I'm concerned about is that with the breakout between the um, overall change in charge being requested at 6, but effective commercial at 8.5, uh, I just want to make sure that we're getting these numbers accurate. So. I'm just throwing that out there and I'll turn it over to uh, Robin. So wait, what, one moment, what, what is it you want? So what we're talking about in their request was a 6% overall change in charge with an 8.5 effective commercial. Um, with that reduction of the 430,000, um, what do those two numbers end up with and are you in agreement with Maureen's calculation? Okay, and I, I, I want to clarify too about the 430,000 because it sounds like it's being stated that the staff agree with the network on that. We don't. We were not actively involved in calculating that. Um, we actively listened to their explanations and um, uh, encouraged them to submit their written response. So I just want to I just want to clear that up that we were not we were not in agreement with it because we didn't walk through the calculations with them. So we have real really no way of verifying that four hundred and thirty thousand dollars mentioned. But we will um, certainly walk through what um, the reduction would be with the four thirty as the network laid it out and also um, Maureen's conversation as well. 
Well, I'd be interested in then also, um, and I think we're going to end up coming back to this after lunch on this one. Um, I, I'd like to know the differences between um, your disagreement and trying to get to the uh, core of this matter so that, um, I mean, if if there's no basis for the 430,000 number, then that's troubling too. Um, I took Mark's um, explanation at its words, but again, I have not seen the math behind that calculation. So, um, and Kevin, I can just clarify, um, you know, on the, the the dollar value that was put in for commercial was five five million two hundred and eighty three thousand, and the value of one percent was six hundred twenty one, and that does work out to be eight and a half percent. So, if you take five two eight three divided by the eight and a half, so those were. The the calculations that we had before. So and did you calculate four, on in the overall what it reduces the six to? No, but we're approving the commercial rate, correct? Well, it all depends on what the motion is. Yeah, but <laughs> I think we're been focusing on the commercial. But, but any analysis of the system Medicare. does look at the overall change as well. So I just want to make sure that four years from now, somebody's not looking back at this and scratching their heads on on what was done here. Kevin, I'm just going to make a suggestion. If we're if we are going to break for lunch um, and the the hospital budget team is going to kind of look more deeply into this for CVMC, I guess I would suggest if they could also do the same calculations for UVM to the extent that there was also, I believe, wasn't there a reduction in what the UVM uh, in Dr. Brumstead's letter or in the calculations, which I don't have in front of me, but I, I think that there was, am I right? Oh boy. Yes, I have to pull up the letter. We just received it this morning. That's I the know. trouble with these last minute. Uh, da, 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 da. I guess if there was an adjustment as well for the medical center, then it might help if they're gonna be making some calculations. Yeah, there was an adjustment in the letter. 570,000. Yeah. So I'm just thinking if they could do the same thing, it may be food for thought for our conversation about the medical center. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm actually going to suggest then that we break now and give staff some extra time um, and come back at 115. And hopefully at that time we can go back to Mount Escutney and then proceed with Central Vermont and UVM. Does that make sense to everyone? It does. Can I say one thing before we break? Um, yeah, because certainly. I think it, it may need Mark or someone to do a public comment later, which is I'd be interested to understand the impact of the 8 million in CRF funds that they'll be getting to the bottom line and whether Jen had mentioned that some of their CRF funds were already included in their 20 budget, and I just don't know whether these fall to the bottom line or whether these are already accounted for. And do you want that for UVM as well as CVMC? Yeah, that makes sense. And so for giving uh, Mark things to explain in public comment this afternoon, I certainly will be looking for an explanation of why in the budget hearing they were expecting about 12 million in CRF and they got 32 million, which was $20 million higher. Um, so, you know, just some homework for Mark and some homework for our staff. 